a topic of heated disagreement between black pillars and people in the mainstream, is the question, does hard work pay off? And my short answer would be, yes, but. And the long answer is the rest of the video. So without further ado, let's get started by explaining Simpson's Paradox. To quote Wikipedia, Simpson's Paradox is a phenomenon in probability and statistics in which a trend appears in several groups of data, but disappears or reverses when the groups are combined. Let's look at the two charts on the screen as an example. In the one above, the correlation appears to be positive when you're looking at all the data combined in, into a single set. But in the bottom chart, when you break the data set down into three different groups, within each of these groups, we observe a negative correlation. And I think Simpson's paradox is very relevant in the discussion of whether or not hard work pays off. So let's look at a typical way that a lot of black pillars um, answer the question, does hard work pay off? And they will look at the world population and they sort of sort every, they sort all the humans by their quality of life. They look at a group of people who have a high quality of life and a group of people who have a low quality of life in the world population. And they start naming the, the factors that are responsible for that difference. And I believe the black pillars are correct when they identify factors such as being born in a first world country or a third world country. Are you in an area that has access to education, clean water? Are you at a place that is, is in a war right now? And because we're on the topic of black pill, we can't go without mentioning the all important factor of genetics. Black pillars are correct in identifying these as, as factors that are more important in determining people's quality of life across the world, um, more important than hard work. You know, I, I don't think that hard work even makes the list of the top 10 biggest factors in differentiating between people's different qualities of life across the world at the macro scale. And when you look at this, essentially you're seeing that there is not a strong correlation between people's effort level and their quality of life. You may even say it's a negative correlation. Oftentimes we see people who are who have lower standards of living in, in less fortunate circumstances. We see that these people work harder than the people who are more well off. Now here's where Simpson's paradox comes in because if you break down, because so far we've been looking at the, the world population in this single data set, but let's break this down into people, of, uh, into groups of people with similar circumstances. And let's group these categories into subcategories and keep narrowing, narrowing it down until we have v a groups, a very many groups of people with very, very similar circumstances in life. And I think that when we break down this giant set of people into these smaller and smaller groups, then hard work begins to emerge as a more and more dominant variable that explains differences in people's outcomes, in people's quality of life. At this point, some of you watching this video may say, well, Turbo BP, that's obvious. People who were born into the exact same circumstances have the same genetics, same socioeconomic status, same location, well, then obviously hard work is going to be a big factor in determining where they end up. All you did was remove the black pill aspects from the equation. And my response to people who say that is, I think the black pill community tries to answer the question, does hard work pay off in the wrong way? The approach we ought to take is not to compare the famous American rapper to a guy working in a Bangladesh sweatshop and say that because the guy working in the Bangladesh sweatshop works harder than the famous rapper, hard work therefore does not pay off. What I believe is the right way to answer the question, does hard work pay off, is to narrow down the data set to the smallest possible data set of one single data point, a single individual. And you can't draw a correlation from just one data point. So we're gonna take this data point and generate more data points from it. And these new data points will be possible outcomes of where this person will be in five years. Possible outcomes of where this person will end up in 10 years. And in our analysis of the data set of these hypothetical data points, here comes the question that determines does hard work pay off for this person 
Is there a weak or a strong correlation between the quality of life of these data points and the amount of work that this person puts in in the next five years, in the next 10 years? This is the correlation that we need to be looking at. And that's because I believe the question, does hard work pay off, should be answered at the micro scale rather than at the macro scale. And my opinion is for average people in developed countries, we're not talking about people who have literally zero mobility, zero opportunities. For average people in first world countries, the correlation would be pretty strong. And some may argue that even once we, we narrow it down this much, when we get as micro as you can, the correlation is weak. Share what you think about this in the comments below. However, with all of that being said, it's really important to note that this interpretation of how to answer the question, does hard work pay off? It's based on the interpretation of the phrase pay off as meaning, does it make a difference in your life? And there are other ways that people in the black pill community interpret the phrase pay off. Another interpretation of pay off is the juice being worth the squeeze, so to speak. Even if how hard you work is strongly correlated with your life outcomes five years into the future, the magnitude of the difference the hard work would make may not be enough to make you happy. You might still say that it doesn't pay off if the best results that you can realistically achieve still isn't enough to allow you to be satisfied with your life. And this angle of looking at the question, does hard work pay off? Um, it resonates with me personally much more than the former. Because although I believe, as I said earlier, that um, my outcome, the outcome of my life five to 10 years into the future will be strongly correlated with how hard I work, I still feel that none of the expected outcomes, none of the probable outcomes would make me happy. I feel that I would need a very improbable outcome in order to be happy. Outcomes that are improbable even with hard work. Outcomes that be far more likely had I been born with different circumstances, different genetics. And that's why to me, hard work doesn't pay off. But I think that most people are able to be made happy, are able to be satisfied by things that are realistically achievable for them. And for that reason, I think hard work pays off for most people, generally speaking. So to answer the question, does hard work pay off? You first have to arrive at an answer to what do you mean by pay off? Because hard work, in my opinion, makes a significant difference when it comes to navigating the region of the map that is accessible to you based on your spawn point in the game. For a high IQ intelligence student with resources, hard work would make the difference between whether he goes to a regular state school or a very prestigious university like Stanford. But for a low IQ guy, hard work could make the difference between him flunking out of high school or graduating high school with a C average. So hard work makes a difference, but if what you mean by pay off is does hard work have the ability to completely free you from the limitations of your circumstances? Well, the answer is no. If it's the low IQ student's dream to go to a school like Stanford or MIT, no amount of hard work will ever turn his dream into a reality. The unfortunate reality is, for plenty of people, not only inside the black pill community, but especially in the black pill community, they can't be made happy by the things that are realistically attainable to them through hard work. The more rare or extraordinary the thing you want to achieve, the less of it is hard work. I'd say being a billionaire is more luck than hard work. Take Taylor Swift, for example. I wouldn't credit her success to her hard work. And that, but that's not to say that she didn't work hard. Just that getting to the position that she got to is not a matter of working 10 times harder than everyone else. The base contrarian seems to have made the error of conflating two ideas. Either he conflates them or he thinks that DBDR and Rehab Room conflate them. In his latest Marble commentary about DBDR and Rehab Room, the base contrarian says, 
well, if hard work doesn't pay off, then why doesn't DVDR try, try not uploading videos for a whole year and see how that works out? So you see, you gotta work hard. Hey guys, today's video is going to be about a comment that I got from DBDR on a recent video. DBDR went ahead and said, you just completely ignored my question. You gave a survivorship bias example. It's like saying, I survived the Titanic because I was rich. What about the people who died trying? And this was in regards to a comment left by the user, enter name, who said hard work often pays off and that rehab room is a crybaby. Now, this is a great debate. Does hard work pay off for everyone? Or is DBDR right? Is hard work, when it does pay off for people, they're just looking at it from, hey, I survived the Titanic. Uh, why didn't you guys get on a piece of wood and you know live? I don't know what's wrong with you. Look, I think the truth is, hard work usually pays off. DBDR's coping pretty hard here because when you think about it, it's like saying, well, why is this YouTube channel successful? Or, right, I mean, let's just go with the obvious. What do you mean? Hard work doesn't pay off? What, what, what would you, then just stop posting on your YouTube then. You know what? Stop, don't post a video on your YouTube for a whole year and come back and then um, tell us about how hard work doesn't pay off. Guys, be like, tell us, tell us you took a whole year off, you're back and you got the same views as last year. You got more now. Right, and obviously he won't do it because he already knows the truth is hard work does pay off. Well, to the base contrarian and people who find his argument persuasive, I think it's really important to stress that saying hard work isn't the reason for someone's success is not the same thing. It's not equivalent to saying that that person didn't have to work hard to succeed. Let's go back to the Taylor Swift example and let's say, let's say if you work hard, you have a 0.1% chance of making it. But if you don't work hard, you have a 0% chance of making it. So in this scenario of becoming a worldwide sensation of a pop star, you absolutely need to work hard. You can't succeed without working hard. But only a lucky few really, really make it big, um, unlike the, the countless other people who also work very hard but don't achieve that kind of success. I think this comment explains it well, but I disagree with the last part. I disagree that Rehab Room conflated necessary and sufficient. Continuing with my response to the base contrarian, I disagree with the base contrarian's take that DBDR is successful because he works hard. Now, DBDR, to me, he seems like a pretty hardworking person. He's applied to lots and lots of jobs. He puts in an honest day's work, but when it comes to YouTube, I would not say he works hard. Call me a hater, but DBDR does not work hard in the context of making YouTube videos. Playing a video game and talking about your life is the easiest YouTube career ever. And DBDR is very lucky to have achieved the following that he has. Like, just think about this from a YouTuber's perspective. If, like, if someone told me that their idea for a YouTube channel is to talk about their life as they play a video game, I would laugh and say, dude, that's going to get you five views. You'd be lucky to get 50 subscribers. Most people who make the kinds of videos DBDR makes, they don't get anything close to the views that DBDR's videos get. And for someone like DBDR to be aware of the survivorship bias, for him to be aware that he can't credit his success on YouTube to mainly his hard work, that level of awareness and humility is a trait that I respect. These two opposing schools of thought. On one side, you have guys like Rehab Room and DBDR who believe hard work doesn't pay off. And on the other side, the opposite end of the spectrum, you have guys like Hamza, First Man, the based contrarian. And one of the big reasons that these schools of thought are, are so different on the topic of hard work is their different perceptions of First of all, how hard the average person works. And second, what the life of a low status man slash incel really is like. People like Rehab Room tend to view incels or low value men as these hardworking men who put in an honest day's work. Uh, these oofy doofies. It's, it's a man who puts in an honest day's work and he comes home and catches his wife cheating on him. A man who puts in an honest day's work, 
but he's never felt the touch of a woman. Or a man who breaks his back working in construction, and then he comes home to a loveless marriage. Rehab room tends to view low-value incel sub five men as、uh, men who put in a lot of work and they've tried everything and they still don't find what they're looking for. They still don't make it. This is in stark contrast to what the other group of people see, views as. The typical low-value incel man, the base contrarian, has a very different idea of what an incel's life is like compared to rehab room's view. Guys, I will tell you this: any guy trying to make it on the streets, streets of some godforsaken country, breaking his back working fifteen hours a day, making ten bucks a day, is tougher than him. Any sub five manlet that is going through this life ringer is tougher than him. Oh, the toughest guy alive. Super me. To cap, such a lie, such a cope. There is no incel that is tougher than David Goggins. You, you need to just please like delete this off the internet. You need to amend the script, homie, because you have to like stop saying this blasphemous shit. Like I'm, I'm not kidding. Like I'm starting to get triggered because, dude, a guy who gives in to every primal urge and just sits around eating hot pockets all day, fucking jerking off a hundred times. Is not more strong than David Goggins. I don't care if you're gonna blame all your suffering because you're ugly or you're short or because you have a small dick, which that I actually get. But all the other ones, I don't really, I don't really fuck with. But the point is, I don't care what your problem is. You don't get to say you're tougher than David Goggins. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. That is some cope cap shit that I've never even fathomed in my life, even hearing outside of another human being's mouth. That because some incel simply has to exist in a state of suffering that they believe society has created on top of them that they haven't done to themselves. Now you're a tougher dude than David Goggins, dude. That's not the truth. Your idea of how hard the average unsuccessful person works informs your attitude. Towards, does hard work pay off? How much does it pay off? Guys like Hamza, people on the men's self improvement side of the manosphere, they generally believe that the average guy doesn't work very hard. At least in the West, they believe that the average person amounts to maybe five, ten percent of their potential. And of course, if you believe that the average person doesn't work very hard. Then it logically follows that hard work gets you ahead of most people. I would really like to see these two sides come together and have a discussion about how hard the average guy works. How hard does the average incel work? How hard does the average unsuccessful man work? And what is the average black pillar's life like? Is the average black pillar sitting at home eating Doritos, jerking off, playing video games, or is the typical black pillar a guy who puts in work but just hasn't found success? Despite trying and trying and trying for years and years and years, the truth's probably somewhere in the middle. But I would love to see a discussion between Hamza and Rehab Room, which would never happen. But that would be some gold tier content for sure. A discussion of this nature has already happened between the OG Black Pillar Face and LMS and Alex of the YouTube channel Playing with Fire, which is like a pickup dating coach channel. Alex Playing with Fire asked Face and LMS Face. What do you think? What percentage of your black pilled audience do you think is jacked? And Face and LMS said thirty percent. Alex playing with fire, on the other hand, said he thinks less than ten percent of the black pill community is is jacked. They're just a little bit like what percentage? Okay, let me ask this question: What percentage、mm-hmm. of black pillars would you say are jacked? I would say thirty thirty percent, not many. I would I say、mean. it's probably less than ten percent, if I had to guess. Probably less than five percent. And this is a perfect example of the divide in between these two schools of thoughts, perceptions of what is the state of the typical black pilled incel, and how hard has the typical black pillar worked. Let's revisit a point I made earlier in this video. I said that for the average person in the West. The correlation between how hard they work over the next five years and where they'll where they'll be five years down the road is is a strong correlation, a fairly strong correlation. And my view 
is probably biased by my experience. That stereotype of、uh, the basement dweller who doesn't exercise, who severely lacks social skills, lacks basic life skills. You know, a lot of black pillars almost see that as like an an insult to the black pill community. The, the, the way that blue pillars characterize incels in that way, you know, black pillars see it as this caricature of of incels. But that dude is me. I am that kind of guy. I, I'm. I have a terrible work ethic. I'm 20 and I don't have a driver's license. I'm 20 and I've never had a job. I severely lack social skills. I lack basic life skills. Because I'm in this situation, I have a bias towards. Believing that hard work is the solution, because I look at all the things that I want to have, and what I see standing in what、well, what I see is between where I am and where I want to go is work, is effort that I am not willing to put in. The things holding me back right now,、uh, not having a driver's license, not having a job, not having a car. I know that all of these things are achievable. These are within my capability. So this probably makes me biased towards thinking that hard work makes a difference in people's lives. And what I've noticed is that in the comment sections of rehab rooms videos, the the people who believe that hard work doesn't make much of a difference to where you'll be five, ten years down the road, these people tend to be older in age, guys who have their shit together, guys who have consist consistently put in effort, but they feel that their life's going nowhere. And if that's your experience, then it's no wonder why you would be inclined to believe not only that hard work doesn't lead to happiness, but also that hard work doesn't make much of a difference to your life anyway. And I think it's apparent that this is rehab rooms' target audience: guys who've tried and tried and tried and failed. I first found out about rehab room and the black pill. Uh, back when his channel was ITV, Incel TV, I was about 16 years old, and then me not having a driver's license and me not having worked a job was these were way less problematic stats to have. And as I got older and lacking these things began to be a bigger and bigger problem for me, it too became more. Glaringly obvious that I fall outside of rehab rooms' target audience. This narrative not only allows them to take credit and feel good about themselves, but also blame and gaslight less fortunate people. One thing that successful people do to gaslight people in tough situations, in unfortunate situations, is running the narrative that it is their bad choices that led them there. The importance of behavior. The importance of Effort, importance of work is is staring me in the face more and more, and as a result, I feel further and further removed from the rehab room sect of the black pill community. So his videos don't they don't resonate with me the way they used to a few years ago. All right, guys, I'll jump into the controversial subject of affirmative action in university admissions, and I'm going to talk about this to bring to the table. The environmental determinism aspect to hard work, the counterpart to rehab rooms video about how hard work is partly genetically determined, because in the study that rehab room cited to support his point, th- those stats also said that hard work is partly environmentally determined. There is a whole lot more to the topic of affirmative action, but、uh, I'm just going to focus on this subtopic in this video. About、uh, how hard does a student work、um, when it comes to to school studying extracurricular activities? How how's that hard work influenced by their upbringing? I'll be making generalizations here about different groups of people, and it goes without saying that I'm not saying that everyone is what I'm saying they are. I'm only talking about averages. And first of all, to get this out of the way, hard work outside of school because.、Uh, Uh, when it comes to non-school related things, I'd say the average black kid in America probably has to put in more work than the average Asian kid in America, because if you're black in America, you are statistically more likely to be poor, and therefore you're more likely to have to work a job in high school 
Whereas if you're Asian in America, you are statistically more likely to not be poor and not have to work a job in high school. The average black kid in the U.S. Pro also probably puts more effort, works harder when it comes to athletics than the average Asian kid does. And if you're a black kid in the U.S., you're statistically more likely to be in a single parent household, which means you'll probably have to put in more work doing stuff around the house than a kid in a two parent household would have to. But let's focus on hard work when it comes to academics and extracurricular activities. It's, I think it's quite evident that on average, uh, Asian students in the U.S. generally work harder academically. They put more hours into studying than other ethnic groups of students do. But what's the reason for this? It's not genetic determinism. It's environmental determinism. We all know about the Asian parent stereotype, which has a lot of truth to it. Education is emphasized very, very heavily in Asian cultures. Asian parents are more likely to send their children to uh, standardized test prep, to summer schools, academic summer camps, make them do math practice outside of school, teach, start teaching them math at younger ages, and math that's more advanced than uh, what they're learning in school. And, and look, to, to tie this back to the hard work thing, you know, th there are a lot of things where hard work makes a big difference, right? Uh, school is one of them. But a lot of people, they, they sort of think like, uh, if you didn't work hard, it's your fault. Or you, you worked hard, then it was all you. And the, it just ends there. The discussion ends there. And they don't talk about wh what about, what about the factors that would cause someone to work hard in a particular area of life? You, you might have kid A who uh, worked harder than kid B, but Kid B might not have received the, uh, you know, the, the same kind of teachings from their parents. Kid B's parents might have lower expectations of, of Kid B. You know, Kid, Kid B's parents might not have taught Kid B, uh, you know, to work hard in school the same way that Kid A's parents did. So, you know, you have to ask the, the, the question, is it really Kid B's fault that he doesn't work as hard as Kid A works in school? The pull yourself up by your bootstraps school of thought would say, well, kid B just needs to work harder. But what if kid B has a single parent who didn't go to college? But what if kid B goes to a ghetto school where, you know, if his classmates catch him taking notes in class, then, then they'll slap him on the back of the neck. If you believe in free will, you can say, well, technically anyone can choose to work hard uh, in school. Anyone can choose to put in the hours, study five hours for the, for the exam. But, well, anyone can, but Kid B won't. Realistically, based on his environment, he just won't. And uh, the debate around affirmative action is about whether these environmental influences should be taken into account. This and uh, other environmental influences, uh, you know, such as the quality of the school itself, you know, the funding that the school receives, the programs they offer, crime, violence, which I won't get into in this video, but they're relevant environmental influences too. I think to form an opinion on this subject, you first should take a step back and ask, what is the purpose of college admissions? What is the goal that we're trying to aim for? Are we trying to select just purely based on competence, the best students, the best performing students? In that case, it should be a pure meritocracy. There should be no affirmative action. There should be no compensation for any statistical disadvantages. On the other hand, Maybe college admissions select for competence, but you're also trying to select for talent and potential. And in this case, you need to take environmental disadvantages into account. When we talk about talent, potential, we're talking about nature, not so much nurture. And I'll make an analogy. Uh, take, for example, Mary. She's a girl in a very sexually conservative culture. Where Mary grew up, it's all monogamy. Uh, there's no hookup culture. Very strict, no sex before marriage. And uh, let's say that Mary has a body count of three. And now let's say there's a woman named Jane in a culture who grows up in a different location, a culture that is m far more sexually liberal, promiscuous culture where there is hookup culture. The average body count in that, in that location is, uh, let's say 10. And Jane has a body count of five. Now, if you compare the body counts of Mary and Jane, in absolute terms, Mary, with her body count of, of three, is uh, you know more more pure, so to speak, than Jane with her body count of five. By pure outcome, Mary is less promiscuous than Jane is. But what if we're trying to 
look for uh, like a natural predisposition towards chastity. Like who, who, which of these women has in is in is it in their nature not sleep around, not hook up? And if you look at it through this lens of trying to select for for let you know the equivalent of talent, then Mary would be less pure than Jane, because even though Mary has grown up in a culture that's very very monogamous monogamy oriented, and she has had all the environmental influences pressuring her. To only have one life partner, she went out of her way to have three times as many. Whereas Jane grew up in grew up in a culture where everyone around her, her peers, they all have body counts of ten, fifteen, and she only has a body count of five. So really, who who has the most pure nature? I would say it is Jane. So likewise, when it comes to comparing two students from different environments, let's say a student named Bob. Uh, his parents only expect him to get a C, and Bob gets a B in school. And compare that to to James. James's parents, uh, they're very very hard on on James's education, right? They expect him to get an A, and James gets a B. The the both of the students have the same outcome, but what about their their potential slash talent? Which of these students, let's let's say, is is the most scholarly minded? I think Bob probably has greater innate scholarly potential than James because Bob's parents only expect him to get a C. They're kind of lax on his his school stuff, right? And Bob still goes out of his way to study and get a B, whereas James gets all the pressure he you know from his parents to get an A, but he still falls short and only gets a B. So affirmative action is rooted in this black pill adjacent. Environmental determinism. The、uh, even your hard work is affected by factors out of your control.、Uh, way of thinking. So I'm surprised that supporting affirmative action policies is is not more common in the black pill community. This statistical, realistic way of looking at things, looking at the world through the lens of cause and effect, seeing human beings as functions. That take inputs and produce outputs based on these inputs. This way of thinking has its downsides. It seems that whenever this、uh, sort of、uh, you know whether it's genetic determinism or environmental determinism, whenever this stuff is pushed, it always seems to remove some of the onus placed on every individual to try their best. It demotivates people by taking away the "pull yourself up by your bootstraps" attitude, which I believe is valuable. I truly believe we are all equal as human beings. If we are obsessed with something and we truly pursue our passion with everything we have, regardless of any anything else, if you are obsessed, work hard, put in the time, you will succeed. And and that is a philosophy that I carry, my coaches carry, and and to see LeBron James, who's like a mega.、Uh, How are you? A superstar over here and a phenomenal, phenomenal athlete. Share、um, that belief is is inspiring right back to me. It, it shows that we are thinking correct. You know, this is this is hard work. This is an obsession. Nothing can beat hard work. And some of you watching right now might say. Turbo, you're making a false dichotomy. Turbo, you can acknowledge the limitations of your circumstances and still be motivated to work hard when it is worthwhile. At the same time, I used to think along these lines too, but I think now that it's idealistic. I think that it hardly ever works out in practice. Why don't we see black pill realists succeed? Who do you know who is、uh, highly successful? Who doesn't believe that hard work pays off? Do Do you know anyone who achieved great things who didn't believe in hard work and believed in determinism? When we look out in the world, people who have the combination of believing that they're victims of their circumstances, who also are hardworking, have strong personalities, are consistent, resilient, very motivated, self-driven people. These people who have both are very, very hard to find. They're far and few between. The reality is, as much as many in the BP space don't want to admit this,、um, the, the BP school of thought 
and uh, you know the practice of being this self-motivated, self-driven, productive contributor to society, they are direct trade-offs. And I think this is a critical, critical drawback of spreading the black pill school of thought. And as people on the right, the conservative side of the political spectrum point out, this too applies to affirmative action and the mindset that being a supporter of it entails. There are all sorts of drawbacks to the BP realism school of thought. Even though I believe it's the truth, it doesn't mean that it can't harm people. And I'll dive further into these in my upcoming two-part video series about 26 arguments for and against spreading the black pill school of thought. Consider subscribing if you want to be notified when it comes out. Now about Rehab Room. Some say that Rehab Room has malevolent intentions, that he's making his videos in order to bring people down in order to keep people from succeeding. And I don't see it that way. I think Rehab Room has, is, I think Rehab is well-intentioned. He's trying to make it so his target audience, which is people who have tried and tried and tried and still failed, uh, he wants to make them not unhealthily overwork themselves to pursue a, a dream that's based on false hope. I think this is his goal in the video he made about David Goggins. And it's something that I can stand by. But with that said, there's also the other side of the Black Pill community. The, uh, the kind of people who is the opposite of the rehab room sort of reference point. It is low status men and incels who may or may not be sub five, who do lack social skills, who don't put themselves out there, who are young, and haven't tried very much, haven't worked very hard. People like me. And the risk with these people being exposed to the black pill content that isn't really meant for this cohort is, what well, well, Rehab says uh, that hard work is partially genetic. You know, the science, the science shows that hard work, that, that your conscientiousness is a trait that is partially genetically determined. And, and for these people... I don't see how being exposed to this information wouldn't drain the, the last few drops of motivation that you do have. I think for these people, it's, it's more important that they get their shit together than to know the absolute truth. When it comes to my situation, I think that anything that could motivate me to learn how to drive, anything that could motivate me to get my first job at 20 years old, even if the motivation is based on false hope, it would still benefit me. And I have plenty of time to figure out the dark, dark truth when I'm 40 and balding, but I don't have plenty of time to get my shit together. At this stage in my life, knowing about the genetic determinism, the harsh reality truth isn't the most important thing. The thing that makes Black Pill kind of risky, a risky school of thought, is that it has no protection system. It's like driving without insurance. The blue pill school of thought and religion are built upon a foundation of faith that um, makes it unlikely for your level of hope to drop below the minimum level of hope you need for um, good mental health. But when it comes to the BP school of thought, there is no lower bound to how low your hope can go. Some BPers in the community would probably say, good, face the reality no matter the consequences. And to that I say, I, I just have to say I disagree. To kick off the final section that will conclude this video, I ask you, do you want to live in a world where hard work pays off? Would you like to live in a world where hard work pays off big time? And I think most of you would answer yes, but think about what that would mean. A world in which you have, you know, plenty of opportunity for your hard work to pay off big time, for you to make it really big. That's a world where people, a lot of people who have a lot of talent are kind of lazy and don't work hard. So a world where hard work pays off big time, big wins for people with average or below average talent is a world that will have fewer medical breakthroughs, a world with less innovation, a world with less excellence and more mediocrity. Sure, it makes it easier for any given individual to make it, but it's a pretty suboptimal world. 
that progresses slower than it could. You know, the thing about hard work is at the macro scale, the more people do it, the less the difference it makes on average. So does hard work pay off at the individual level? Sure, it does, but it pays off at someone else's expense. It can't pay off for everyone at the same time, for there are more pickers than fruits. However, I think that most things in life, dating included, are not zero-sum, are not purely zero-sum games, but are moderately positive-sum, because the process of pursuing the rewards that are in limited supply cause uh, positive side effects to be generated. For example, pursuing women, pursuing relationships, uh, which by itself is zero-sum, but in the process of doing so, a man might go from obese to down to a healthy weight. And uh, because of that, there's now, uh, you know, he's going to live longer. So his health is improved. You know, he's going to have more time alive to spend with his family, less burden on the medical system, all sorts of positive side effects through the pursuit of a win in this zero sum game, making it actually positive sum. But I plan to go deeper into this topic in a different video. This has been Turbo Black Pill, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.